I was just saying, learning how to act with like I've never, you know, I've worn sunglasses, you know, on different shows where you take them off and then you kind of do your acting. It really is a whole different thing. You have to actually move your head more to make a point because it's not like all in your eyes and stuff. And the worst part is, I was actually watching Daredevil to kind of see how he did because you don't realize that he's yeah. acting most of the time with his glasses on. Right, right. And I was like, oh, he's oh, moving his head a lot more. He's directing towards someone. Or this or that. So it is a, it's a whole different look. Were you doing like method acting with wearing shades a lot and trying you know, to get I gotta tell you, it? it's funny. When you're in like certain scenes that are like darker, a lot of the show is, you know, late at night or in clubs and stuff. I have run into many things. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, can we get like a fake pair where I can see that? I don't need the polar, polarized lens on them. But no, it was very, you, I've walked into a few things. There was no method, it was real. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have a question for Theo. Yeah. So, obviously, in this more part, uh, kind of part of the MCU, yeah. Shades doesn't have his powers. Yeah. Is there going to be hinted at later in the yeah. season? Is there going to be some sort of workaround or come in later on? I played the fifth. No. Um, <laughs> you know, you, know um, uh, uh, you guys have seen what you've seen and it's, uh, there's, there's a lot going on in there. Um, I, I think sort of the, the when we started out to talk about Luke and, and how that world was going to be revealed to everybody, it, it's always best to stay as grounded as you can. And, and while there's a long history with this character, um, you know, I think starting out, what we wanted to do was be able to to bring to life someone who, if you're a Luke Cage fan, you you it's it was the first question everybody asked, which is who's going to play Shades, uh, and by the same token. It was important to us to be able to, to allow that character to grow and be integrated. And, and when Theo came in, you know, it, it really wasn't a question of who was playing the part. It was just, it simply you know, came in. Because one of the things that's, that's important to us is that when you look at, at the way that Mike is playing Luke, you know, he is a larger than life personality. He is a larger than life presence. Uh, and, and, right, and so, you know, we needed somebody who, in many ways, was not intimidated by that. In many ways, that didn't even matter. And and what was kind of fascinating about the way that, that Theo brought to the role, which was, no, I, I'm actually the hero of the story. So it, it, it's not a problem for me that this this person that's a disturbance and what I need to get done, we'll just eliminate that person and then we'll continue with our story. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think, what, you know, what's, and I say this, and, and I say it every day when I was at work, it's like sometimes you forget that, because you don't think the word superhero, that you're on like a superhero show. You're, you know, you're just in there living in this world. Right. That it just so happens that there's a guy in it who's very strong. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It, but you're just going about your day doing your thing whatever that is and you just happen to be in this world with people who have these strengths or powers or whatever but to me it was no different than the, you know, the same mindset the cunningness and, the, and then all the games that are being played it's just he just Happens to throw you halfway across the door. <laughs> yeah. And again, I, I mean, I think that's what's important about all of our uh, the Marvel television shows, but in particular the, the shows that we're doing on Netflix, is is that it does come from a very real and grounded place. And so it is, for all intents and purposes, it's the story of a man who has to accept responsibility for who he is. Right. That's the story. If you watch that story and you're caught up in that story, and then, oh, by the way, he can also bench press an automobile, right. that's great. But that's the icing on the cake. If, if right. what you do is you start from a place of, he's got superpowers, and he's bulletproof, and he's going to come in, and there's going to be big, giant action, you'll hit an audience. You'll hit the audience that's here at San Diego Comic-Con, and they'll be very happy with you. But we're trying to tell a story that resonates with everybody. But they probably can't tell you what the story was that they just saw. It was just a lot of action, bang, boom, this, that, and then they don't really remember what was the story. What was the point of right. that story? I mean, when you're dealing with one of the greatest comic book writers, you know, and you're dealing with, you know, um, everything comes from an extremely real place. Every move, every look, Everything that happens from minute to minute, every character, as I say, it's about the relationships. It's coming from a real and organic place. That's where you're supposed to start. Right. All that other stuff is just bonus. You know? and, and when we would when we would talk with our directors, it was the, it was the thing that we would always try to make sure that they understood. It's very important that 
what happens in this scene has nothing to do with you're on a superhero show. <laughs> for all intents and purposes, you're watching a crime drama. For all intents and purposes, you're watching a story of redemption. If you can get those things to come across, then everything else will work out fine. The audience will actually suddenly go, oh, we forgot. There, there, there's, oh my gosh, this whole a fight broke out in the middle of a soap opera. So, you know, that's basically what you, you want to have happen. Gotcha. There were times I was watching Jessica Jones and all of a sudden, like, be those rare times when she jumps up to the balcony. I was like, I totally forgot that you could do that. I didn't even realize that because I'm so into exactly what's happening in her struggle and in her thing. And I think that it's the same with us. Experience the same thing myself. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's how you know the job is being done. Exactly. And that's exactly what's, you know, the same exact thing that we're doing here. That's what we're so excited about. Can you talk a little bit about actually from the Marvel kind of top-down perspective how, you know, this is kind of sort of installation in the Netflix collaboration you guys have done, how you approach kind of the meta-level storytelling? Uh, look, it's a very good question. And, and, you know, as the person who is the head of television and is responsible for all of that, the, the best part about it is, is having a great team, having a group of people that, that starts with Alan Fine and Dan Buckley and Joe Casada in New York that are, that are continually looking after the whole grand scheme of it, but also on the ground level of having people like Jim Corey, who's our head of production, and, and uh, Kareem Zarek, who is sort of responsible for the day-to-day of what's happening on the shows. Um, you know, it's those kinds of people that care everywhere that of what it is that we're doing. Is there an overall story that we're telling? There is, but it's also, we have a responsibility to, much like in the comics, to tell stories that will exist on their own. So that if you've seen Jessica Jones and you met Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, awesome. We think that's great. But we can't bet on that. We have to be able to tell a story that when you come into this, you've never met him before. You don't know who he is. You don't know what his story is. You don't know what his past is. Some of that stuff we purposely left out of Jessica Jones. Um, but the reason why Mike and Luke were in Jessica Jones was because that's their story. And it was, and Mike said something earlier that I thought was really interesting, which is Jessica Jones was from Jessica's point of view of who Luke Cage is. You didn't see scenes with Luke Cage on his own. Behavior. Now, he comes to Harlem in order to figure out his life. And we are now going to be able to see the world from his point of view. Uh, and in the same kind of way, but, you know, we get to see Danny Rand and we get to see the story of Iron Fist, we're going to get to see a whole different view of where these street-level heroes are. Uh, and, it, and I think if there's only one meta thing that we do look after is, is that you know, there's no bigger fan of the Marvel movies than I am. But at the end of the day, the Avengers are here to save the universe. In this world, the street-level heroes are here to save the day. And in some cases, they're here to save themselves. And, and if we can make you care about the people that are in the show, and we can make you care about the hero, it actually, on many levels, you can empathize in what's going on even more so than the giant epic roller coaster wonderfulness that are the Marvel movies. But what's at stake in those movies is so huge and so beyond what it is that we're going to do. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact that we're on television. And because we're on television, it has always been that TV is something that you invite into your home. You're not in a theater with a screen that's 400 feet wide. It's a very intimate experience. And what's more intimate than the way that people are now watching television is they're watching on their phone. What do you do with your phone? You press it against your face. So <laughs> if, if it's going to be that intimate, it better be something that is compelling. Because people need to have a reason to stay and watch. And in our particular case, they have to stay and watch for 13 hours. It's not as though our story is going to get wrapped up in two hours of, of neat little, you know, incredible adventure. Uh, you know, our stories need to be told in a way that you're, you are compelled, you are driven, you are absolutely just hungry to find out what's the next episode. And hopefully when you get to the end, to go back and watch it all over. Yep. And that's the humanization of it. And I think that's such a beautiful, you know, uh, what it is. It's how now with television, it's your choice. You're you're going to either go to that next episode or you're not going to. With a movie, you're in it. You sit down, you're in it. 
bad, good, and different. We've all walked out of movies and go, oh, man, that was terrible. Why did I just sit there? But you sat there for two and a half hours, three hours, or whatever it was. But the television, you got to make people go to that next episode, that next show, the next one. The only way you're going to do that is by getting in touch with the humanity and making them feel something in those characters that relates to them, whether it be reluctancy or taking a chance or heartbreak or something with relationship, anything. Sunglasses, yeah. absolutely. Everybody wears sunglasses. Everybody, everybody knows like what shades are. They might not like them. They hurt your nose sometimes. But you know what? You gotta do it. You gotta, it's better for your eyes. And your skin's very soft around. <laughs> <laughs> very soft. I noticed. I stood out in the sun yesterday and they killed me. Should have wore sunglasses. Should have took my own advice. <laughs> so, so that is, you know, that is such an important point. And I think that that's what's so intriguing about television in general. You know, is that people are going there for stories, into the stories, and this is absolutely no different than whatever shows are being awarded, awards, and all this kind of stuff, high drama, as they might call it, you know, it's no different than any of this. That's what you're doing. Sure. Uh, since you talked about the characters, um, the Harlem is also a very important character in this, and... Uh, in the same way that you need to believe in the actual personal characters, uh, you nailed Harlem in a way that wasn't necessarily, like, I'm not, it's not like in Daredevil where I see something that's supposed to be Hell's Kitchen and is Avenue B, and I'm like, streets are too wide, buildings are too, like, well, everything. Hell's like, Kitchen doesn't exist anymore because it's all but gentrified. Exactly. So in order for us to be able to, it yeah, it absolutely right. But you nailed Harlem. So well, we was that was that yeah. was that the influence of the New Yorkers working on it, or was that like? No, I we we've said from the very beginning uh, that there are really five defenders. There's Daredevil, there's Jessica Jones, there's Luke Cage, there's Iron Fist, and then there's New York City. Right. Um, and it was always intended to be that way. And so. You know, we shoot all over the city. We're on the rooftops. We're in the subways. We're up in Harlem. We're down at the docks. We're we're everywhere that we can go. And so we're trying to get to a, to a place where it does have an air of authenticity to it. Some of those things you you can't do and are on a stage because it's just you know that's the best way for us to be able to do things. But for the most part, I, I'm in absolute awe of our production team uh, in, in the fact that that you know we try to get out as much as we can and and uh, you know I think Theo can speak to that meant being on some yeah. pretty cold nights. We shot the dead of winter. Yeah, we love so it. And, and the, actually, that's one of the things that is. We were talking about this yesterday. Is is much like it's very hard to tell it's raining on film unless you actually augment the rain when you light the rain. And sometimes you're sitting there and you're watching. And if you're and the problem is if you're paying attention to the rain, then you're not the drama. <laughs> we're not doing our job. Yeah. But but you can sometimes notice on people's shoulders that they're wet, and you're going. I don't know. But it's not. It doesn't look like a training. And the other thing that that we we found is is that for the most part you don't see people's breath. And, and I'm lucky enough that I'm there in a parka in, in Video Village, like looking at a little screen going, yeah, we're ready to move on. These guys I are saving I have a thin layer of gabardine of a suit between me and that cold, la that exactly. cold weather. But with Harlem, it's like you can't fit. If you're from New York, you realize you know when you're in Harlem because the buildings are lower, the streets are wider. It's just a different feel in Harlem than it is, you know, for, say, Staten Island or Brooklyn or Manhattan. You just feel good. And that's why we were so lucky to be up there and actually shooting it. You know, it's, it's it's just incredible to be a New Yorker and, and shoot. The, the the architecture, the people in the street, the way that the streets are run, uh, and then just uh, the thing that the word that we always come back to is the musicality. Of it. So there's a rhythm to Harlem that is different from anywhere else in that city, and and it, and it infected and affected the way that we make the show. And and that was all Taylor. That was from the very beginning. Taylor came in and just talked about how important it was. I gotta tell you, my brother lives in Washington Heights, and he was texting me one night like it was some kind of explosion. It was super weird. And then the next day, I heard like new cage film, like, films explosion. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.